This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Welcome again to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, the podcast that aims to start conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. This is episode number eight, where we're going to talk about Jesus as God's agent within the Gospels. Thanks again for joining us here at the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. My name is Dustin Smith. As always, I am your host. And today we're going to look at what is called the principle of agency. Yes, the principle of agency. Agency is the aspect when a sender sends out his or her agent. Then that agent who was sent can speak for and represent fully the sender. And this principle of agency was so pervasive in the first century Jewish world that it was basically taken for granted by the New Testament authors. And if it's true that we can observe the principle of agency within the New Testament, uh, particularly here in the New Testament Gospels, then Jesus, who was sent by God, can speak on behalf of God, can fully represent God, can speak the very words of God, and even be called titles that are reserved only for God. And so we're going to look at the principle of agency today within the Gospels. We can see that uh, in a repeated phrase in the Jewish Mishnah and later in the Babylonian Talmud is this phrase, quote, a man's agent is equivalent to himself, end quote. A man's agent is equivalent to himself. So from their Jewish understanding that when a man sends out an agent, that agent is equivalent to the sender. You can also see a similar statement uh, in Philo, who was a uh, Hellenized Jew speaking and writing in the early first century. He was also influenced by the principle of agency, and he says this. He says, he who dishonors the servant dishonors also the Lord, end quote. That's from his Tractate uh, Decalogue, verse 119. He who dishonors a servant dishonors also the Lord, to where the, the servant who is sent by the Lord fully represents the Lord, and therefore if you dishonor that servant, you are dishonoring the Lord himself, because the servant represents fully the Lord. In the article on the Gospel of John in the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels, it actually states that, quote, Because Jesus is the chief agent of God, when one confronts him, one confronts God, end quote. That again is from the article on the Gospel of John in the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels, page 377, where it says again, because Jesus is the chief agent of God, when one confronts him, one confronts God. So I'm trying to demonstrate here is that this principle of agency was pervasive in multiple Jewish writings, both within the first century and those that uh, carried forth into the second, third, and fourth century. And also we're seeing that uh, modern scholars are understanding that the principle of agency functions to Jesus because Jesus is the chief agent of God. And thereby, when one confronts Jesus, one is actually confronting God because God has sent Jesus as his principal agent. Now, this principle of agency can be observed in our four Christian gospel accounts particularly in regard to God having sent Jesus. Now, when we use this phrase, sent, it could possibly mean that Jesus was sent from heaven, or it could possibly mean that Jesus was just commissioned by God, as in God has given him a job to do. And so the word actually is ambiguous, and we shouldn't uh, automatically conclude when we see that Jesus was sent from God that Jesus was sent directly from God, from God's location. No, if Jesus was sent from God, it could mean, and very likely means, that God is uh, sending Jesus, he is commissioning Jesus as his principal agent. So there doesn't need to be some a pre-implication of ascending from heaven whenever we see these phrases that Jesus was sent from God. But let's look at how the four Christian Gospels describe this principle. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 40 has Jesus saying this, quote, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. This is Jesus sending out the twelve early in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 10, 40. And he tells the twelve that those who receive them will also receive Jesus, 
And he who receives Jesus receives also the one who sent Jesus. So we can see this principle of agency functioning with actually three different factors. We have God who sent Jesus, and Jesus sent the twelve. And thereby those who receive the twelve receive Jesus, and those who receive Jesus receive God. Another passage here in Mark chapter 9 and verse 37, where Jesus says, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. End quote. That's Mark 9 and verse 37. Again, where if you receive the, re the child in Jesus' name, you receive Jesus. And if you receive Jesus, you are ultimately receiving the one who sent Jesus, being God. So the principle of agency there, very clear. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 43, Jesus said, I must preach the gospel of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. The purpose for which Jesus was sent was to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God, and God ultimately was the one who sent and commissioned Jesus to preach this saving message. In John's gospel, in John chapter 4, in verse 34, Jesus said to them, quote, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to accomplish his work, end quote. Jesus says that his food, what sustains him, what gives him energy, what uh, gives him his daily bread is to accomplish the will of God who sent him and to do his work. So we see Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John all have comments there about God sending Jesus to accomplish the work of God. But Jesus, as the principal agent, as the chief agent, functioning within the principle of agency, is able to carry these things out as God's authorized agent. Now, in order to legitimate Jesus' authority as the one sent, the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, each note that Jesus came, quote, in the name of God, end quote. Now, when Jesus came in the name of God, this means that he came under the authority of God as God's principal agent. And we can see this in a variety of passages. Check out this one here in Matthew 21 and verse 9. This is when Jesus is entering into Jerusalem on the final week before his passion. The crowds were going ahead of him, and those who followed were shouting, quote, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! That's in Matthew 21 and verse 9. We can also see it repeated in Mark chapter 11 and verse 9 and a similar account in John chapter 12 and verse 13. Here we see it's actually the crowds who rightly recognize that the son of David, Jesus, the Messiah, is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And that Lord there is Yahweh. That is the proper name for God. So Jesus is the one that is sent from God, from Yahweh, as the Messianic son of David and thereby he comes in the name of the Lord. We can see a similar passage here where Jesus actually is speaking. Matthew 23 and verse 39, Jesus said, For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's in Matthew 23 verse 39. We'll see a similar passage to this one in Luke chapter 13 and verse 35. Again, Jesus notes that the people ultimately are going to acknowledge him as the one who comes in the name of the Lord, comes in the name of Yahweh, meaning as God's authorized principal agent. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 38, we see the people shouting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. That's Luke 19 verse 38. Toward the crowds, again, rightly recognize Jesus as the king who comes in the name of the Lord, who comes in the name of Yahweh. And in John's gospel, Jesus says this in John 5 and verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. So here Jesus is saying that he came in the name of the Father, thereby he has the authority of the Father, to do the things that the Father does, to speak the things that the Father wants spoken. And even in John's Gospel and elsewhere in the New Testament, to even bear the titles that are reserved for God the Father alone. Because as the principle of agency states, when someone sends an agent, that agent functions as the sender. Now we can see here, because Jesus was sent in the Father's name, and he's recognized by his own mouth, 
and by the account of the crowds as the one who was authoritatively sent, we can see actually that miracles and deeds were done in God's name. Look here, John chapter 10 and verse 25. Jesus says this, I told you, and you do not believe, the works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. Jesus is saying that he is doing these works in the Father's name, as in with the Father's authority and with the Father's blessing. So it's almost as if the Father is actually doing these works, but he's doing them through his authorized agent, Jesus. Now, since Jesus is this authorized agent, he is empowered by God to exercise divine prerogatives, mainly to do things that typically only God does, like we're going to see here, forgiving sins. Look at this passage in Mark chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. The crowd say, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming, for who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he goes on and speaks to the paralytic to get up and take up his mat and walk. That's in Mark 2, 7 through 10. We see there that the Son of Man states that he has the authority from God to forgive sins while the Son of Man is on earth. So it is true that God alone has this authority to forgive sins, but God can authorize human beings on earth to rightly forgive sins in God's name. The biggest example of this is actually uh, the high priest, who is a human being who is able to forgive sins in the Jerusalem temple. But Jesus here is actually functioning almost in a counter-temple movement, saying that he is the one that can actually forgive sins with the authority of God because he is the Son of Man, meaning the apocalyptic judge. Another passage that we could see Jesus bearing the divine prerogatives is in John chapter 5, and verse 17, where Jesus says this, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. This is in regard to working on the Sabbath, where he actually says that God is actually working and functioning now, and so therefore Jesus himself can be working. His argument here is that as God's principal and authorized agent, Jesus can do working because God is doing working. And so thereby, Jesus functions within the principal of agency. Another divine prerogative is the giving of life. Look here in John chapter 5 and verse 21. Jesus says, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. So again, God is able to give life and raise the dead. And because Jesus is God's agent, the Son can also give life to whom he wishes. So Jesus is bearing that responsibility and that privilege from God. We can also see that Jesus functions as the judge, as the authorized and sent judge. John chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus says, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. Very clear there. The Father has given all judgment to the Son because the Son is God's authorized agent. Now, since Jesus is the prophet from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 18, a passage we looked at in a previous episode, Jesus can speak the very words of God because he is God's sent spokesman. And so we see this in a variety of passages, particularly within the Gospel of John, where this principle of agency is extremely important to understand if we are to correctly interpret and grasp the meaning and message of John's Gospel. Look at these passages, John chapter 3 and verse 34. For he whom God sent speaks the words of God. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus the one whom God sent, and thereby he speaks the very words of God. John chapter 5 and verse 30, Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So he doesn't speak by himself. He speaks because God has sent him, and thereby when he judges in his spoken judgment, that judgment is just. Another passage in John, John chapter 7, verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, 
but his who sent me. So even Jesus' own teaching is not really Jesus' teaching. It's God's teaching. But, but it can become Jesus' teaching because Jesus is the rightful authorized agent. Another passage, John chapter 8 and verse 28. Jesus says, I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. So he only speaks things that God told him as that authorized prophet. Lastly here in John chapter 12 and verse 49, Jesus said, For I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. So those five passages there, John 3.34, 5.30, 7.16, 8.28, and 12.49, all demonstrate that Jesus is the authorized prophet and thereby can speak the very words of God. And even after all this, if you're not convinced, Jesus himself says that God has placed his seal upon Jesus, thus authenticating Jesus as the empowered agent. Look at this passage in John 6.27. Quote, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father, God, has set his seal. On the Son of Man, God the Father has set his seal. God has empowered Jesus as the authorized agent. That there again is John 6 and verse 27. Now, if you enjoy the podcast, please consider supporting us as we aim to promote the sound truths of the oneness and unity of God and the humanity of Jesus. If you're listening on YouTube, please consider subscribing and liking and sharing this episode. And if you'd like to offer a donation, you may check out the episode description for a link to PayPal. The Biblical Unitarian Podcast is produced and edited by Dustin Williams. I am Dustin Smith, your host. Until next time, please... Take care.